Hawker Typhoon, which was also known as the Tiffy, was a British single-seat fighter bomber. It came about from a new specification from the Air Ministry in March 1938 for a fighter which would be able to achieve 400 miles per hour at 15,000 feet. Designed by Sydney Cam, who was also responsible for the Hawker Hurricane, and based around the new Sabre Napier engine, this was in fact the largest engine that was fitted to a fighter aircraft during the Second World War. Originally, the idea was to put 12.303 inch caliber machine guns, like those found on the Spitfire, with provision to provide variations in weaponry, including cannon. Being introduced in mid-1941, it was constantly plagued with problems and for quite a few months the aircraft faced a doubtful future. One of the first problems encountered was a leak of fumes which entered into the cockpit. Despite numerous modifications, the problem was never entirely solved and as a result every Typhoon pilot was required to wear an oxygen mask whenever the engine was running. It quickly became apparent that there was a serious structural flaw in the design as a number of tailplane assemblies were ripped off during dives, causing the loss of the plane. The solution was to rivet 20 alloy fish plates externally across the rear fuselage joint, together with some internal strengthening. In total, 25 aircraft were lost and 23 pilots were killed due to the crashes. When the Luftwaffe brought the formidable Focke Wolf 190 in 1941 onto the battlefield, the Typhoon was the only RAF fighter that was capable of catching it, and as a result, it secured a new role as a low altitude interceptor. In the main production series, the Typhoon was equipped with four 20mm cannon. In late 1942, however, when a greater need for fighter bomber missions eventuated, provisions were made to equip the Typhoon with two underwing bombs. And a year later, in 1943, they were first fitted with eight unguided rockets, which became the hallmark of the type, thanks to countless footage of typhoons making rocket strafing attacks in the lead up to D-Day. The first thing that you need to take into consideration is the sheer size of the kit and subsequently the amount of time involved to put everything together. But I must say, everything under the hood fits perfectly and it has definitely been one of the most fun builds I've ever done. This is not just due to the quality of the kit, but I guess the fact that I really enjoyed handling such a large and impressive subject. The exterior detail is very crisp and quite busy. All the main assemblies such as the wings and fuselage fit together snugly with no gaps showing. There was however one area that did require significant filling and that is their air intake cowling below the engine. The kit provides the option to display the engine with all the panelling removed. However it suffers from a common setback of fit issues when the choice to build the engine completely enclosed is made. This however is not that difficult a task to rectify. The main part that lets the kit down in my opinion are the wheels. However, this is easily fixed with the use of aftermarket resin wheels. Unfortunately, I made a critical error during the build. This was not detected until after the paint masks came off. The genesis of my mistake lies in inexperience, in that the vast majority of the kits that I have built over the years have been displayed with open cockpits. With this build, however, I chose to seal the whole canopy, and in doing so, I really didn't realise that I had to check every single gap between the glass panel pieces. This allowed varnish to enter the cockpit and hit the opposing side window. Unfortunately, it is impossible to rectify this mistake without removing the top glass panel. Having used liquid cement for this process, it is unlikely to be removed without damage and double check, in fact triple check, to make sure all the seals around the cockpit glass are properly closed off. Once all the construction is complete, it is important to lay down a sufficiently thick layer of undercoat, as this will allow the other colours to adhere to the model effectively. 
Primers are specially formulated to grip the plastic, often by way of a chemical bond with the plastic. Generally speaking, for the undercoat stage, it is a good idea to use an airbrush with a wider spray cone, something in the order of a 0.5 millimeter. This is especially the case for larger sized kits, as this will not only save your wrists, but also give you a better result. My personal preference is to use a black base. This means using a black undercoat rather than a white or gray one. This technically is a filler product. However, when thinned down sufficiently, it produces a nice consistent surface. When spraying, ensure that it is done with even and regular patterns, building up the layer gradually. When the mixture is highly thinned down, you should see a wet finish on the surface. Often the primer can also act as a microfiller, that is to say smoothing out some of the tiny scratches that may remain after using a 2000 grade wet and dry sandpaper. Once the model has dried for at least 24 hours, but preferably longer, we now apply some pre-shading. This is done in order to give the main colours a slight variation in shades, which actually occurs on the real thing. And this is something that the human eye actually looks for. The centre of the panel, between each row of rivets, is sprayed with a highly diluted mixture of white and is then gradually built up. This is done using a fine airbrush, such as this 0.2mm. As you would with a pencil, you gradually fill it in. I end up doing about three layers on the majority of the surfaces on this kit. My primary focus was on the centre of each square, and from there, moving out towards the edges. The idea is to build it up so it looks a bit like a cloud, and for the most part, avoid the riveted areas altogether. This effect, combined with additional variations created with inks and washes, can really add a lot for a little extra effort. Well, ordinarily, a little extra effort, but on such a large and imposing model, it actually translates into many, many more hours. When applying multicolour camouflage scheme, such as this, you should always start with the lighter colour. This is because if you overspray the light colour outside of the intended area, the darker colours generally have no trouble overcoming the colour below. But sometimes lighter colours can struggle to establish solid pigmentation. This can cause any of the overspray to be seen underneath, or at least causing a darker shade where the overspray occurred. On larger subjects, it is my personal preference to do the spraying freehand. With a good quality airbrush, this can also blend the camouflage patterns in a manner that looks correct to scale. The other choice, of course, is to mask off the pattern. There are pros and cons to all techniques. On the plus side of this one, when done with a decent airbrush, the feathering effect between the colours is much better and more consistent. But on the downside, it is much harder to follow the exact path of the boundary lines. You should always have the reference material adjacent to where you're working and be constantly scanning between the two. If time is an issue, then masking it off would allow for a broad spray cone airbrush to be used, allowing broad strokes and therefore cutting back the amount of time it will take. When spraying the main colours, the most important thing to consistently look out for is to ensure that the paint coverage or thickness is consistent across the whole surface. If you don't spray enough paint, especially with the white pre-shading below, you will actually be able to see the difference. One method which I find effective is to spray the shape and the outline of the pattern area and then to fill it in. This allows for more control and accuracy as your concentration is focused on accuracy when you're doing the outline and then on effective blending and layering when you're filling in the colour. Try and maintain a consistent angle of about 80 degrees when you're doing the outline. This way, all the feathering across the plane is the same. If you wish to increase the width of the feathering effect, i.e. more splash onto the other colour, simply reduce the angle further, but this is highly risky as you can easily overdo it. To ensure a high quality outcome, all the boundaries of this camo scheme were completed off camera due to the difficulties and angles involved. So I'm only really showing the second part of the process, which is filling in the spaces in between. 
When you're filling in all the space between the boundaries, the primary purpose that you're trying to achieve is to blend everything in, whilst at the same time working with the pre-shading to achieve subtle variations within each color. Make sure that each patch blends with its neighbors and the surface as a whole, for instance, the whole wing or the whole side should be comparable with the other wings. Prior to applying the wash, the whole model was sprayed with three coats of acrylic gloss varnish. This is done both to protect the paint underneath, but also to provide a gloss, i.e. a smooth surface for good decal adhesion and to prevent bubbles being created underneath due to uneven texture of the surface. The decals were then applied to the whole kit. Decal softening solution is then used to make the decals melt onto the surface. This is generally applied twice with a good few hours in between and then sealed with a quick burst of gloss varnish on the decal and around its edges. I find using an enamel ink wash is the most effective wash for panel line as it is easily controlled and generally quite thin when it dries. The acrylic washes I find are better for the grit and grime part rather than as a general wash. I think this is mainly due to the difference in size of the wash particles with the inks being much smaller. Try to restrict the application of the wash to within the rivet holes or panel lines and apply as sparingly as possible. But make sure that everything gets covered. It is better to go over an area a second time, should it be required, than to remove built up excess in the first instance. As with other stages, there is a large amount of surface area to cover, but the detail that you get to work with and appreciate along the way is just amazing. When cleaning up the wash, use a good quality cotton bud, dipped in enamel thinner. Try not to over soak the bud. It should be sufficiently wet that the whole bud contains moisture, but not so much that it holds excess liquid. If too much was absorbed, simply press it again against a tissue to remove any excess. When wiping off the wash, try and wipe in a perpendicular direction to the panel line, and in the case of rivets, work all around them with the general theme of leaving a bit of grime towards the rear of the airflow. In general, the crispness of the moulding means that the ink stays exactly where it needs to be, without much effort, making this task a lot simpler than in most other builds. The last thing to add is the exhaust smoke. There are various different techniques for this and here I'm using a simple one, that is pigments, which are required to be built up. Depending on the level of gloss or semi-glossiness will determine how easily the pigments will be to apply. If it's a completely matte surface, as this is, then it is applied very easily and somewhat permanently. As you can see here, I built up the smoke quite heavily and possibly slightly too much. There are examples of it getting this dirty, but be sure to make it consistent with the rest of the weathering. Once all the washes are applied, the chipping process is then added. Focus around the edges of the hub and especially on the blades, primarily close to the hub. Then there are a few random added chips here and there in the middle.
This is probably my favourite part, as I think it really brings the subject to life in a big way. Be sure to do some homework before you begin. Look up some photos of the real plane, online, in books or magazines, etc. The chipping usually builds up in certain areas above others. This is mainly due to the movements of the work crew and the pilot on the surface of the plane. The main areas are around the cockpit, the engine access panels, the front edge of the cannon, and the cannon and ammunition bags, including where the crew would walk on to get them. Also, the leading edges of the wings, where stones and other debris might hit, and the steady wear and tear of the air When applying the chipping, be sure to use an ultra-fine brush and apply very sparingly. Go over an area again, but it's actually very difficult to remove if you have overdone it. The most important thing to keep in mind is that it needs to be random within the scope of the area. Random, but also logical. So for example, try and imagine where the substructure might be and where a path might be formed due to high traffic. Make sure that the two wings look similar with equivalent levels of chipping. The overall feel of the plane should be the same unless you wish to clearly distinguish an old or new panel or part. The first step is to apply the lightest color liberally as the majority will be wiped away. Focus primarily around the blades. The next step is to apply the thinner over the top of the whole area. Allow it to soak in for a little bit, then slowly begin removing the excess. You can use both wet and dry cotton buds, depending on the amount that you're seeking to remove. Once the majority of the excess has been removed, the finer adjustments can be made with a wet wide brush. Gradually smearing it all around while wiping the brush periodically. Once the lighter brown coverage is complete, some darker colours are then added, very sparingly and with some thought. These are then wiped down and blended in with the wet brush. Once all the washes are applied, the chipping process is then added. Focus around the edges of the hub and especially on the blades, primarily close to the hub. Then there are a few random added chips here and there in the middle. The last thing to add is the exhaust smoke. There are various different techniques for this and here I'm using a simple one, that is pigments, which are required to be built up. Depending on the level of gloss or semi-glossiness, will determine how easily the pigments will be to apply. If it's a completely matte surface, as this is, then it is applied very easily and somewhat permanently. As you can see here, I built up the smoke quite heavily and possibly slightly too much. There are examples of it getting this dirty, but be sure to make it consistent with the rest of the weathering. That's all for this episode of Scale Model Cinema. I hope you enjoyed it and will join us again in the future. For more information, please visit scalemodelcinema.com or visit us on Facebook. Cheers.